Look around. It doesn't take long to recognize the brokenness surrounding us. Division, hatred, fear, uncertainty. The pain we're witnessing is real. And the need for a savior is undeniable. It's this need which broke the heart of God and moved him to do the unimaginable. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son, eternity, to be the perfect sacrifice for us. Love on a cross, dying once for all, laid to rest in the darkness of a tomb. Today, as we face so many unknowns, may we remember the simple truth of Easter. The stone's been rolled away. The grave is empty. Jesus is alive. And love has risen. Well, once again, uh, I want to welcome us uh, together. Again, for those of us that are here in person and those that may be streaming uh, online, very grateful to have you. This is the most important day in the all of history. The most important day in all of history, not only for the Christian calendar, for, but for everybody worldwide. For today is the day that we celebrate the truth of the resurrection of Jesus that the grave could not contain Jesus and that he has risen victoriously and changes everything. The course of all of human history is changed on that Easter morning, the first day when Jesus rose from the day. But we hope to explore this morning what the resurrection means for us personally and collectively, what it means for us as individuals, as families, and as a people, what the resurrection means. Might mean, And if you are a guest with us this morning, as I know and presume some of you are, I want to extend just a special welcome. I'm very grateful that on this most important day in all of history that you've chosen to worship with us, that you've chosen to be with us. And so I just extend a special welcome to you. I'm glad that you are here this morning. And I pray that God would speak to you and to would remind you of some things that even your heart knows at the very deepest part. If you are a guest or a, well, or a visitor with us, I uh, hope that you feel like family when you leave. At least a little bit like family when you leave. And if you're a regular part of the Crossroads family, it's just always really good to worship and be alongside you as well. But this morning I want to read for us a passage that talks about the very first encounter of the risen Christ. And it comes from John chapter 20 verses 1 through 18. So if you have a Bible with you or an app or on your phone or something, you want to open that up. Or you can follow along on, your screen, on the screens behind me. Uh, but on John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18 is going to be our passage we're going to settle into a little bit this morning. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to unpack it a little bit, see what we can learn together as we seek to understand what the resurrection means for us personally and collectively. So John chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon, Peter, and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. 
And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. I don't know where they have have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Then he was thinking he was the gardener. She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him. And I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. She told them all that she had say, said. Sorry, she told them that he had said these things to her. So this is the passage we're going to sink our, ourselves into a little bit. And as we do, let me pray for us. And maybe God would open our eyes to something that we need to hear this morning. Jesus, we come to you, the risen one, with humility. And we ask now that as we submit ourselves to your word, would you teach us? Meet us where we are that we might encounter you this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, this Easter Sunday, I want to talk about, kind of consider this theme that light has won. Light has won. I want us to think about things as it relates to Easter with this kind of theme in mind. That light has won. Though our world may seem dark and heavy at times, the light of Christ has won. That it is victorious. That our world may seem dark, heavy, and uncertain at times. But I want us to consider the resurrection and how it means, what it means that light or Christ has won the day. Has been been victorious. Because Christ is risen, hope is established in the midst of the darkness and in the midst of the heaviness of a world that seems uncertain at times. Because Jesus is risen, hope is established And light has won. And we can live with confidence in the presence of our good God with us in all things. So I hope that this morning that that we would be able to understand the resurrection personally. And I hope that we'd be able to understand the resurrection as it means for our families and what it means for the world at large. And I hope that you know this morning that while things may seem dark and while things may seem heavy, personally and maybe as a community at large, the resurrection of Jesus gives us hope. For those who will follow and trust in the resurrected Jesus, it gives us hope that cannot be extinguished by the darkness and the heaviness of our world. See, the resurrection is what separates Christianity from any other world religion or world major philosophy in the world at all. The the resurrection is what separates Christianity from all other ways of thinking. It it separates it and puts it on a class of its own. Because only Christianity, only faith in Jesus, declares that death has definitively been beaten, that the darkness cannot hide it, that the darkness has not won, but death itself has been conquered by Jesus. Only in Christianity is the death been defeated, which means that it's only Christianity and it's only in following Christ that we are free from that which holds us back from an eternal kind of life. It's only in following Jesus that we are freed from anything that would hold us back from eternal living. And it's only in Christ and only in his resurrection that can secure for us a hopeful eternity. Even though our world seems dark personally and even though our world seems dark collectively, it's only in the light of Christ that we have an eternal hope. This is what we celebrate. This is Easter. And this is why I am glad you are here. Wherever you are in your spiritual life, for the resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of all. resurrection of Jesus is the foundation and the security of all eternal hope. And a life with God is made possible because light has won. 
And so this morning, wherever you are in your life with God, I want us to consider the resurrection. And I want to consider it from Mary's perspective. Her story in the resurrection story and what it tells us about how to live our lives in the midst of a world that can seem heavy and can seem dark at times, can even seem hopeless at times. What Mary's story, what Mary's interaction with Jesus at the empty tomb can teach us about living in a dark and heavy world at times. And I want to look at Mary's story for a couple of reasons. And the first reason is that Mary's story and and her witness to the resurrection speaks to the authenticity of the resurrection. If you're someone here this morning who's a little skeptical, a little doubt-filled, maybe you're not sure if this whole resurrection story is true, you're not really sure if this Jesus really did rise from the grave. One of the reasons that we have to understand the authenticity of the resurrection, that it's not a fairy tale, but it actually did indeed happen, is because Mary's testimony one of the reasons we can point to the, the, the authenticity of the resurrection that we can build our whole life around, that we can put our whole hope in, that it's trustworthy, that it is true, is because of Mary's testimony. That it's not a fairy tale, it's not something that was made up centuries after the resurrection, some centuries after Jesus had died and was buried, but it is true and it's part of the reality that we can live in. You see, if you were going to make up a story, if you were going to make up some fairy tale, especially one of such extenuating circumstances as a resurrection, or as, a, as a rising from the dead, then you would want to bring out the most credible witness. You'd want to bring out the most credible testimony as possible. And in ancient culture, women, well, women's testimony wasn't admissible in court. It was dismissed. It, in fact, her testimony would have been thrown out without even being listened to. And so the fact that Mary is the first witness to the resurrection of Jesus, the first one to encounter Jesus, the first testifying about the resurrection of Jesus, it points us to the fact that it must be true. It's not something that somebody made up and brought out testimony that would have just been thrown out of court. It's just one of the many pieces of evidence that we can point to, to the reality, the authenticity of the empty tomb. And so I want to consider Mary's encounter with Jesus for that reason. But there's a second reason that I want to look at Mary's encounter with the resurrected Jesus, and that is that her interaction with Jesus gives us insight to how do we live with our lives with hope amidst the darkness and the heaviness that may presume around us, the darkness and the grief and the sadness that is around our life at times. That we can live with an eternal hope, steadfast kind of hope, firmly planted in Jesus, the resurrected King, no matter our circumstances. Because her life gives us a model of how to do that. Her interaction with Jesus. So I want us to notice a few things about Mary. And about Mary's story, her part of the resurrection story. And the first thing I want us to look at is that Mary goes to the tomb while it is still dark while it was still dark. Jesus was crucified on Friday because it was Sabbath. Nobody would tend to his body. They they took it down, they put it away, and it was dead and it was buried in this tomb. She would come early on Sunday morning, but it was still dark. Now, it wasn't just that it was physically dark, though it was. Early and had not risen yet. It hadn't given light to the world around her. Her world physically was dark, but it also was emotionally and relationally dark. For her, Jesus had died on Friday. The heaviness and the grief of Friday was still weighing on her, and she was in this dark cloud, and yet she came to Jesus. Now, we don't know all things about Mary's story, but one thing we do know for sure is that Jesus had freed her from seven demons. We don't know exactly what that looked like or what it meant like, but what we do know is that that interaction with Jesus had changed her perspective, had changed her life, and she wanted to be with Jesus. And so she followed Jesus. Her interaction with Jesus led her to follow after him and to be with him, but the crucifixion interrupted that. 
The death of Jesus interrupted the hope that she had, the the life that she had. The crucifixion and the death of Jesus on Friday caused confusion and pain and grief and this overwhelming dark cloud to, to gloom over her life. And yet while it was dark, she went to the tomb. What I think is so great about Mary and about her story is that she didn't wait for the clouds to dispel around, for the sun to come out, for her confusion to, to kind of dissipate. She didn't wait for her grief to kind of get over it. She came near Jesus in the midst of her darkness, in the midst of her pain, in the midst of her grief. While it was dark, Mary came to the tomb. She wanted to be near Jesus. Can I make a suggestion for you and for me this morning? That the only place, the only place to go when things are not going the way you want them to go, when the only place to go when things around you are confusing, the only place to go when things are dark and heavy is to be near Jesus. To be near Jesus. With whatever amount of faith you may have, mustard seed kind of faith, small little faith, with whatever amount of faith you have, when it is dark and it is heavy and it is confusing and it is grief stricken, the only place to go is to be with Jesus. I don't have all the answers for what is going on in our world today, for the issues we face on the global scene and the issues we face on the local scene. I'm confused as many of you are confused about the difficult, dark times that we seem to be living in. And I've sat with many of you and I've shared your grief over the struggle over these last few years, these last few months. I don't pretend to be unaffected by the world around me. I don't pretend to be unaffected by the heaviness and the darkness that seems to be growing in the world around me. But one thing I'm learning One thing I'm learning these days more and more, that when it seems dark, when it seems heavy, when it seems grief-stricken, more than anything, I want to be near Jesus. I want to be near Jesus. Mary came to the tomb while it was dark. And when she got to the tomb, she was surprised to find that the stone had been removed. And she was scared, not knowing what to do. So she went and found Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, who we assume is John. And they came running. They find that the tomb is empty too, but there's no body. There's no body. So Peter and John, in their confusion, they don't know what to do. So what do they do? They, they run home. They go back to where they're staying, maybe to get the other disciples to make a plan B. What are we going to do? The the body's gone. What are we going to say? People are going to ask us questions. Let's come up with a plan. But notice what Mary does. Notice what Mary does. There's a second thing I want us to take a look at. Mary stays. She doesn't rush off. She doesn't make a plan B. She doesn't come up with what are we going to do? How are we going to spin this publicly to let everybody know what's going on? She stays. She doesn't rush off. She doesn't make excuses. She stays in her grief. She stays close, as close as she can to where Jesus is. And in so doing, she encounters the risen Christ. She encounters the risen Jesus. In her darkness, she encounters Jesus. And her darkness is transformed into hope. Her pain is transformed into gladness. These last few years, we've been living collectively, have we not? In a sort of darkness, a pandemic, and the loss of all kinds, loss of jobs, loss of loved ones. And we know what it's like to live without clarity. The divisiveness of our political climate that we live in, resurfacing of racial tensions, physical isolation have continued to keep us, pushed us aside, away from each other. I've heard experts say that, estimate that we live with 80% less human interaction now than we did prior to the pandemic starting. And yet we've been wired for community, for people to be near us. We've been wired for that. We've been isolated for so long in this grief or in this dark cloud for so long. And it is beginning to take its toll, is it not? It's beginning to take its toll. And how do people generally respond when their darkness 
comes, gets too big for them. Well, oftentimes people run. They run from the darkness. They do anything to mask the pain and the grief. They run from it to just help us forget for a little while. We pick out our phones and we veg out for hours on end. We stay busy with one task after another. Sometimes we'll get involved with destructive behaviors, alcohol, drugs, sexual fantasies, and the list could go on. We run from anything that would tell us that it's dark outside. We run, we pretend that it's not really there. We run and we try to mask it on the outside. But Mary didn't pretend. She stayed in the pain and in the grief and she stayed near Jesus. And the miracle of Easter is that Jesus met her where she is. The miracle of Jesus is that Jesus, or the miracle of Easter is that Jesus met her. And he transformed her grief and her doubt to hope. Transformed her sorrow into joy. And hope is restored. The other disciples, Peter, John, they missed it. They missed it. They got busy. They ran off with plan B, and, and they missed it. Now, there's grace for them. Jesus will come to them later. But that moment, they missed it. They missed it. Mary comes to Jesus amidst her pain, amidst her grief. She doesn't rush, brush it off. She doesn't rush past it. She stays. Third thing I want us to notice about Mary's story and how it interacts with ours. In the midst of all of that, Mary experiences the miracle of Easter, and that is the comfort of Christ's presence. The comfort of Christ's presence. A voice, she's outside the tomb, weeping bitterly, and a voice from behind her says, why are you crying? She thought it was the gardener, so they interact a little bit. They talk a little bit, and then, then he calls her name. He says, Mary. And the presence of Jesus in her life dispels all the darkness. Her eyes are filled with hope. Because, and some of you know this, when the creator of the universe calls your name, and he knows you personally, and he sees you in the darkness, and he sees you in your grief. And you're not just one in a crowd, but he knows you, and he calls your name. Nothing can compare to that. Nothing can compare to Jesus. And his presence in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our grief, and it transforms it to everlasting hope. That's what Easter is about. That's why we celebrate. Because Jesus paid the price for all that would hold us back from living the life that we were created for. Jesus on the cross paid for the price for all that holds us back from an eternal way of living. We are rescued from everything that stops us from living the way that God would have us live. And the miracle of Easter is not just that Jesus died and rose again. As amazing as that is, the miracle of Easter is he is personal and he knows your name. And he speaks your name in the midst of your darkest days, in the midst of the grief stricken, in the midst of being isolated away from people. Jesus knows your name. And when he calls your name, it changes everything. It's personal. The miracle of Easter is that eternal life is available, both now and lasting and to eternity. This is what Jesus meant when he says in John 3.16, the most famous Bible verse in all of history, for God so loved this world that he gave his one and only son that anyone who believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Eternal, everlasting life is a life experienced with God, with his presence in our world, in our darkness, in our midst right now. And that is what is offered by Jesus, a with God life. And the with God life is eternal because death cannot extinguish it. 
A with God life is eternal because death cannot interrupt it. It continues to go. God's presence is with us now and continues to be with us into the rest of eternity. It is an eternal way of life. The miracle of Easter is that God calls you by name into eternal life right now. And here's something important to know. See, Mary's circumstances didn't change immediately. There were still Roman officials who were outraged and very dangerous, for, especially for this young following of Jesus. There were still Jewish leaders that were conspiring against Jesus' followers. There was still great uncertainty before Mary. Her situation, her circumstances didn't change overnight. But the dark cloud of uncertainty, the dark cloud of sorrow, of grief, was replaced by the presence of Christ, risen That light has won. Death cannot extinguish it. The death is not the end of the story. For Jesus is the victorious king. And death itself can't hold him back. That is the miracle of Easter. That the king of the universe knows your name. Eternal life does not mean that our circumstances immediately change But eternal life means it's the gift of the presence of God. In the midst of all that we're going through, the presence of Christ that bursts forth with hope and joy. For darkness has not won. It has indeed been conquered by Jesus, our risen King. The glorious truth that we celebrate and sing about is that He has risen. He has risen indeed. He knows everything about you. He knows all that is holding you back from an eternal way of life. He knows all of your insecurities and all your fears and all the sin that needs to be dealt with and needs to be released. He knows all that holds you captive. And in the crucifixion, he takes on all of it upon himself. The darkness of the world and the darkness of my life and the insecurity and the sin in my life. And in the resurrection, he is the only one capable of establishing eternal hope. In my life and in your life, the God of the universe, King Jesus, knows your name. So the question for us on Easter, will we trust in the finished work of Christ to bring us hope, or are we still trusting in our own ability to some kind somehow manufacture control in our life? Are we going to trust in our own ability somehow to make ourselves something that really never brings eternal satisfaction? Or will we learn to trust and to hear the voice of our Savior and the presence of the risen King transform our dark, grief-stricken time to days of hope and joy and eternal living. Now, I don't know where you are. I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey with your amount of your faith, wherever you are. I don't know the personal brand of darkness that you seem to be walking around in these days. But I pray that you would know this morning that light has dawned, the King is risen, and your Savior is calling you by name. And He knows you. He has come to rescue you and me. And perhaps this Easter, perhaps in these moments, we would take an intentional step towards following him. To not just hear a good message and get dressed up nice and have a good Easter dinner, but to intend to grow and to walk and to place our confidence in the one who calls us by name. To follow him. And not follow our own ways. And in so doing, may we live the power of Easter today and tomorrow and the next day. And may it bring joy and hope, no matter our circumstances, for he is risen. He is risen indeed. Let me pray for us. Jesus. I pray that you would speak to us. That you would enable our hearts and our ears to hear you. To respond 
with a life of following you. That we lay down the pretense, we lay down the abilities that we think we can manage and maintain some semblance of control in our life. We lay it at your feet. We thank you that you have taken it upon your shoulders. I pray this Easter that we would live in the reality of your grace in our life. In your name we pray. Amen.